writing down of bug reports, tracking of test results, that those acts by themselves have no intrinsic value, none. Testing only has value when it connects to something that the organization and other stakeholders value. There are people. There are people in the, the organization, perhaps people you haven't yet thought of, who are interested in quality and are interested in testing and are interested in having competence in the product and are interested in knowing about what's wrong with the product. These are things you can help them understand. These are services you can provide. We need to identify the services we can provide and identify our consumers, the, the, our customers, the people for whom in the organization and perhaps even outside the organization we produce this information and then work with them to make it better. So what I just gave you an example from a previous slide. Who needs the information in your bug reports and how can you make it better? Okay, this is a great conversation to have, and it's an easy conversation to have. And you know what? Not only is there value in having this conversation in the sense that you will be able to, to do a better job and thus be more effective and efficient as a tester or a test manager, there's value in having this conversation, period. There's a political value. It sends a, the, all the right messages about you and your organization, if you're a test manager, or you as a, as a professional tester within your organization. You send a message to people that you care about the quality of your work. And it sends exactly the wrong message, particularly given our association with quality, that if we don't have this conversation. So I really would encourage you to, to do this. It's, it's just it's good on so many different levels if you just remember that you're providing a service and then, and then continuously strive to find ways to provide that service better. Now, when you do that, that's going to lead you to the next possible stupid thing that I want you to try to avoid doing, and this is ignoring a key stakeholder. So one time, long ago, when I was young and foolish, uh, I didn't ask all the right people this question. How are we doing? How can we do better? I forgot to ask the tech support team. Now, I have an excuse. It's, it's a bad excuse but I'll let you, let you in on it so that you don't fall for it yourself. My excuse was the tech support manager wasn't in the same office. She was in a different office. She was in a different city, different state. I would have had to, gee, I don't know, pick up the phone, send her an email, do something horribly inconvenient like that to try to get in touch with her. Horribly inconvenient. It's, it's out of sight, out of mind. Now, you know, yes, this is a well-known human resources slash management uh, paradox that uh, people, you know, you take, take people who communicate daily and put them just on separate floors in the same building and the amount of communication between them drops, you know, by an order of magnitude right away. Yeah, it happens. But, but you know, one of the things that we're supposed to do as managers, if you're a manager, is to manage those kinds of problems. And um, I, I, I blew it. Okay. Big mistake. Because she and her team were not happy with our test coverage, and they were not happy with the bugs we missed. And ultimately, the agitating that she and her team did about the dysfunctionality, if you will, of our testing led to, in, in confluence with some other unfortunate circumstances that were going on, led to the test team being disbanded. Now, I mean, I don't think that this was, it was entirely the case that this one person's agitating was the only cause. These things never happened for a single reason, but it certainly was a contributor. That, along with the fact that um, the the business was was in trouble and they were looking for something to cut. But you know, as the Japanese saying goes, the nail that sticks up gets pounded down. And I definitely transformed myself and my team into the nail that stuck up in that organization drew the attention, unwanted attention, of people by virtue of the uh, obstreperous complaints of one of the key stakeholder teams. Now, I got another excuse, and it's not a good one, but I'll lay it on you. Uh, most of the test groups we assess have and do ignore at least one key stakeholder. So I guess my excuse there is, well, I'm in good company. Yeah, everybody does it. Yeah, that's true. But 
you know, why do it, right? Like I said, how inconvenient is it? You send an email, you know, pick up the phone. If you happen to be in the same building, go downstairs, get a little exercise going up and down the stairs, you know, it's not hard. So this really, it, there are all sorts of great excuses for why people ignore key stakeholders, but they just don't really hold any water. None of them are valid excuses. And remember, the job you save may very well be your own or your team's. Now, you want to identify the stakeholders. You want to keep in touch with them. You want to make them feel like, yeah, you know, the, the test team is looking out for me. They're trying to do the right things. But this needs to be more than just a touchy, feely, emotional, um, subjective exercise. This needs to be measurable. So um, I recently wrote a chapter for a book that will be coming out in the next uh, four or five months called Beautiful Testing. Um, and the chapter that I wrote was called Beautiful Testing Satisfies Stakeholders. And one of the things that I, I talked about at length in that um, that uh, chapter was working with stakeholders to identify key performance indicators, metrics basically, that will allow you to measure how well you're doing and to improve that. This makes the discussion about how am I doing um, an objective one. Now certainly, you know, perceptions matter, but data can shape perceptions. And I would encourage you to go into this with data because, you know, things can happen that, uh, that would be very difficult for you to control, and, and you need to shape the terms of the debate about how you're doing rather than be shaped uh, by it entirely. Okay, now here's here's another thing. It's a really easy mistake to make as a test manager. Uh, deliver bad news badly. Now, now the reason why um, testers and test managers make this mistake is because we have to deliver bad news so often. We have so many opportunities to make this mistake. Now, here's an example. I'm working as a test manager. The project is in serious, serious trouble. There's an enormous bug backlog. And um, so I go to the project manager, and I, I tell him this. I say, we are in a world of hurt. Um, things are going very badly. There's this enormous bug backlog. It's a thousand bugs. Well. This is a, a mistake. Um, uh, it was, was a mistake on a number of, of levels. And how, how was it that I was do, doing this badly? I mean, it was the truth. All those things were true. But what were, what were the bad elements of it? Well, the number of them. One was I didn't tell them early enough in the project. You know, it's like telling somebody after they've already fallen off a cliff, you should have been more careful and not fallen off the cliff. Now you're going to die. You know, it's, it's just not very helpful to deliver such information at that point. Um, you know, I mean, 500 bugs in the backlog, 500 bugs awaiting action, some sort of resolution, you know, fix defer decision or actual fixing. And if, if, if 1,000 bugs is a problem, isn't 500 bugs a problem? And if 500 bugs is a problem, isn't 250 bugs a problem? Isn't, isn't, isn't 200? Isn't maybe 150 or even 100? I mean, the project had been in a bad way and getting into a bad way for a long time. And yet, by the time I told him, this really was, um, it was very, it was late in the game. I mean, it's just like that, as I said, you know, you tell them something, they've, they've, they've already fallen off the cliff. Um, and furthermore, I compounded this uh, by not offering any good solutions to him when I, when I told him. And... Now, at that point, I think, given the 1,000 bugs, I mean, there really weren't any good solutions. But there, it, earlier in time in the project, when, say, we had 250 bugs, I could have offered um, some good solutions. The only solution that I had to offer this guy at that point, when I told him, you know, we've got this huge problem, so I said, well, I think we should just lock ourselves in the office over the weekend, all of the managers on the project team, and go through all the bug reports one by one and, and decide whether we need to fix